Pacific halibut. Of all the Northwest and Alaska fisheries, this one has the most tradition, the greatest mystique. Like few modern professions, it is an enterprise steeped in its own history. Amazingly, halibut schooners built near the turn of the century remain viable competitors in the contemporary race for profits. And the fishing style, called longlining, is little change from its inception during the Great Depression. The men who spent their lives pursuing the huge flatfish never seem to escape the spell of the business that consumed them. My uh, grandfather is halibut. My father fished halibut. All my life I fished halibut. You think at the dinner table I could look at one of them in the face? I just never seem to get enough. Sometimes I think the fish got me hooked instead of the other way around. The birth of the Pacific halibut fishery occurred more than a century ago when schooners like the Edward E. Webster, the Molly Adams, and the Oscar and Hattie sailed round the horn from Massachusetts in search of the bounty of the last frontier. Don McCoffrin directs the International Pacific Halibut Commission. Halibut fishing began on the coast about uh, 1886 uh, with, the, uh, uh, with a couple of boats coming from the east coast and fishing off the west coast of Washington. The first deliveries were made in that year, and they were, they were sizable deliveries. And that perked people's interest, and more and more fishermen joined that fleet, and uh, the Canadian fishermen joined. And uh, by the 1920s, uh, practically the whole stock from Northern California to, to the Aleutians was being fished. If the earliest fishermen were from New England and the Canadian Maritimes, Norwegian emigrants soon began to play major roles. Harold Locken began his tenure as manager of the Halibut Industries Fishing Vessel Owners Association in 1924. They mostly came from, in the early days, from relatives. Uh, a father would uh, bring a son in, or bring a brother, or uh, they would uh, uh, bring people from Norway. And the people from Norway, of course, had experience uh, in the old country in, in fishing, so they were good candidates for, for fishing here. Sometimes, their route to the United States was a circuitous one that led through remote ports like Prince Rupert in northern British Columbia. Andrew Ness was a case in point. Well, I, I couldn't get a pass into the, United, into the States, so I had an uncle here that had a halibut boat, the Venture, and I had a brother that was here. He left two years ahead of me. So they told me if I were into Rupert, they could come in there and pick me up. And so they did. In those days, you could go into Rupert and, you know, fill out the crew. But that didn't last very long because they got a new consul there and he chased us all off. So I made two trips in 1929. Locken's grandfather built venerable examples of the early halibut schooners. He muses about their remarkable longevity. My grandfather was the builder primarily of halibut schooners, and uh, the first one was built uh, in the late 1880s, and he continued uh, building boats until 1919. Many of the schooners that he built are still in active operation today. The Turnschild is one of them, and I believe it's the oldest halibut schooner in the fleet, but uh, it is being uh, operated every year, and. Uh, it's uh, one of the, the high boats, so uh, it's uh, a vessel in which I take a certain amount of pride. There are others uh, like the, uh, the Paragon uh, uh, and the, the Van Sea and vessels of that kind that are built by my grandfather, and they're, they're still operating and will continue uh, to operate, operate uh, into the future because they're, they're low cost. and. Uh, the, uh, the original cost has been paid for, and all that's required now is, of course, to, to keep them in condition, which uh, is uh, a lot uh, less than building a new boat. The character of uh, uh, the waters in the North Pacific, and they're somewhat uh, the same as uh, the waters in Norway, and uh, the schooners are wonderful sea boats, uh, quite adaptable to the rigors uh, 
of fishing in the North Pacific Ocean. The style of fishing, of course, uh, called dory fishing, where uh, the, uh, the crews of the vessels uh, left the schooner itself and fished from the dories, and uh, they were set out uh, uh, periodically and then uh, picked up uh, later in the day and the fish were dressed uh, on board. It was a hard way of like, making a living. There were uh, quite a few casualties where dories were lost in bad weather and it was uh, discontinued by the uh, International uh, uh, Fisheries Commission, Halibut Commission, uh, uh, in the early 1930s. Carl Servold had an even better view of dory fishing. I started long lining in 1930. My dad was a skipper and I was an engineer and a cook and then there was 10 fishermen, five dories. They were partners, see, two guys to the dory. And uh, one guy in front, one guy in the back. They'd go, get up in the morning and they'd go over to the side and, you know, six o'clock, five o'clock, real early. And then they'd set the gear, and uh, they had a buoy and a flag, and throw that out. And then they'd come aboard and eat breakfast and bait up, just keep baiting for a couple hours. They had a hand gritty. It was a crank with a little wheel out on the side, and the line uh, came over and went under. And the uh, guy in the back coiled and took the fish off the hook on uh, Norwegian steam. <laughs> That's what it was. I remember in uh, 1930, uh, we were long lining. And the uh, price was real low, two, three, four cents. But we come in alone one time from up west. We had 40,000 pounds, we got nine cents a pound, and the man's share was $200. Now it's $2,000. If we'd made 600 bucks a year, it was pretty good. A lot of boats went in debt, they went in a hole, they didn't make anything. Pay the groceries and that was it. Halibut fishing was hard work, there's no kidding about that. It was. Tough, tough life, but we'd lived through it. We're still here, still kicking. <laughs> In 1932, after his father's death, Servo became the youngest skipper in the fleet, the 22-year-old master of the Torden Shoal. He remembers not only the rigors of fishing, but the crude methods of navigation practiced at the time. We didn't have Loren. No depth sounder, nothing on the boat them days. We had the lead over the side and 16 pound lead and then they put butter in the bottom of it. And so then they'd, the guy'd haul it up, you know, at a high speed winch. And he'd haul it up and then he'd grab it and he'd, you know, show it to me in the pilot house. Up, the, show me the bottom of the lead, what kind of bottom. And they'd, scrape it off and put some clean butter on. We'd run away and drop the lead. I used to sound for hours sometimes. I'd, then we'd sit and by God, we'd be right there. <laughs> we'd get the fish. When fog set in, they picked their way along the coastline on the inside passage that led from Seattle to the Alaska fishing grounds and back again. We toot the whistle, of course, and uh, inside and listen for the echo on the mountains. And I had two guys up on the bow listening. That's a fact. Run down Johnson Straits, full speed, toot. And they'd listen and they'd see over there. You, you know, you can, sound travels 1,100 feet a second, so you could time the echo on it, see how far you were offshore. Lifelong Alaskan Gordon Jansen grew up around the fishing fleet in the tiny community of Petersburg. My dad made his first trip on the Constitution uh, in, in 1912. 
The Constitution was a, a, a schooner that carried dories, and the dories were launched, and the fishermen went to different uh, areas to, uh, close by and, and uh, set their gear out and uh, let it stay a while and hauled back, back and, and delivered their fish back to the Constitution. Imagine being in a very small dory out in the middle of the ocean that <laughs> and, and where you could be lost in the fog and other things that, other hazards that come along with being on the ocean. But just think of those poor fishermen that had to hand crank the gear up from the bottom and, and get those fish on the boat when the, there wasn't more than about that much of the dory above the water, you know. What, what a poor way to do it, <laughs> I thought. Briefly, steam-powered vessels competed with the halibut schooners. The, the steamers uh, came into the, uh, the fishery uh, between 1900 and 1910, and, and they continued for 10 or 20 years. But uh, they, they were too expensive to operate, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, they were gradually phased out, and their places were taken by the, the halibut schooners. Although the steamers proved too expensive, schooners continued to thrive. Soon, instead of launching dories, fishermen realized that the gear could be set and hauled from the deck of the schooner itself. Fishing was conducted uh, by setting out skates of gear, and skates of gear would be uh, a coil of line on which uh, uh, hooks uh, were fastened, and uh, the hooks, of course, were, were baited and set over the uh, chute in the stern of the vessel, and uh, they, uh, the gear could be set in one long line, maybe uh, uh, several miles in length, or it could be put in uh, parallel lines, and then uh, in, in retrieving, uh, the gear would be hauled over the, uh, the rail of the, of the vessel uh, on deck, and then the, the fish would be cleaned on, on deck and then uh, 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 preserved in uh, ice uh, uh, in the hold of the vessel. Halibut fishing is, is a very uh, skilled uh, way uh, of fishing uh, and uh, in the past uh, um, people would come in uh, wanted to go halibut fishing and out of uh, ten people only one would remain the other nine would find the life uh, too rigorous and uh, not to their liking Jensen was one who endured for more than half a century you have to be strong and healthy for one thing <laughs> basic <laughs> And be able to be able to stand the ocean, not get seasick. I think that's one of the <laughs> one of the really most important things. If you're seasick, you're not worth much. And uh, be ambitious and want to make a, do your best to make a living. I guess that's probably the most important things. It's just like any other job. It's, if you want to make a success, you have to work hard. And and the fellows that work hard and produce get the jobs just like anything else. Like Jensen, Stan Johansson grew up in the Norwegian community of Petersburg. And like Jensen, he got his start at a tender age. I started going with my father when I was nine years old, so uh, I was with him most of the time. And uh, He had built this new uh, schooner, the Mitkoff, and come to Petersburg with it in 1927. And I guess it was in, in, 20, uh, in 1929. He said, well, it's about time you start fishing. <laughs> So, so he took me out, and boy, did I get sick. <laughs> I just swore up and down I'd never go, to, go out again. But the next, next year when our school vacation came, I could hardly wait to get out again. At nine, the young fisherman didn't even qualify for a greenhorn share. They fixed up two lines of gear for me, and I baited that, and, and I told them where to set it when they set the gear. I'd, and then when, the, when the, those two lines of gear came in, if there was any fish on it, they were mine. They let me have them, and I marked them. And when we come in and sold them, well, they, they all had a ganyan tied around the tail, and, and when they weighed them. And one time, I remember, we sold up in uh, Seward, I guess it was. I, I think I made 18 or $19, and the crew didn't make anything. In those days, there was no coal storage in Petersburg or anything, and they, uh, they would go out and fish, 
and uh, they'd, they'd first they'd have to go and, and get floating ice from Frederick Sound and, and, and get chunks of ice aboard and beat it and put it in the boat. And they'd go down out and fish and they'd watch for the steamers that would come. And when the steamer went by them, they knew he had to go by and then come back to Peter. He'd be in Petersburg at a certain day. And they'd go out and get some more ice, and go out into Petersburg, unload the fish and put them in boxes, ice them in boxes, and send them on the steamer to Seattle. And my dad said, sometimes we'd get some money back and sometimes we wouldn't. Good times or bad, however, year after year, the men returned to the fishing grounds to practice the art of long lining. The first thing that happened was a flag was thrown over, and a buoy, and then the line, buoy line that reached to the bottom to the anchor was thrown after. And as soon as the anchor was thrown, the gear would be going over the chute. Then this continued on until all the gear was in the water. And then you'd wait around at least six hours or to see, wait to give the fish a chance to bite. And your captain would bring the boat up to the buoys and up to the flag and it would be hauled in and then gagged. And then the boy line would be put around the, the ship and then dirty and the process would be take all the fish in. On the other side of the boat was a, one another one of the men that was coiling the gear down. And, uh, and be, when you were five men, why there were two men would be back in the baiting, bandwidth, baiting the gear, getting it ready to set out again. The long line was, in, in those days, was, they made a hemp, hemp gear, about, oh, about five sixteen, seven eight six. Ganyans were usually cotton, and they were about three to four feet long. And a hook, it was a hook with a gap of about an inch and a half, steel, stainless steel hook. Andrew Ness remembers the early days. Well, those days when you were nine months, you had to take your turn and go around. You bait it, and then you would go to the ruler, and then you went and goiled, and that's the way it kept on going. Sometimes you were a long time, and if you had to move, well, then you, because you got a little rest in between. There's a rule of thumb when you were nine men, you stayed 12 hours on deck, and then you were supposed to get six hours off, but of course, it was more 14 and 16, and <laughs> the rest in the bunk. We had one trip, this was on the city of Seattle, both had part in. And we happened to run into pretty, pretty good fishing, and we came in, we had 120,000 pounds. This was a big trip in those days because not, most of the halibut boats didn't carry that much fish. And we, well, we must have gotten a fair price because we, our stock was 30,000. In other words, we sold fish for $30,000 more. And we got into Seattle Times, I don't know what page we were on, but <laughs> the, the, the check was in there. <laughs> so we thought well, we didn't have to fish anymore. But the next trip we went out, we were just as hungry again. Fishermen worked for shares, not wages. Each man worked for a percentage of the catch in what they called the lay system. When fish were plentiful and the price was good, there were shares of plenty. If the fishing was scratchy or the market soured, there were shares of hardship. When we first started fishing, the boat, boat share was 20%. That came right off the top. And then the expenses, fuel, and supplies, and all these other things came next. And then the, then the rest of the money was divided equally among the captain and, and, and the crew. Remember, when I first started fishing, we got cash and we just went down the forecastle. And since I was the youngest and uh, I had to keep, you know, write down the record and keep track of what, how the money was distributed. The captain, when he went to the settlement house, or, or to pay the bills while he always got cigars, you know. And <clears throat> some of us didn't smoke, complained. And why are you always getting cigars? And why don't you get something that we can ha use too, you know? <laughs> he didn't think much of it, but <laughs> it was sort of a little something different. Why don't you get some bananas or some apples that we can have? <laughs> As fishing technique improved, so did its impact on the halibut resource. In the early days, the fleet simply kept moving north and west in search of virgin stocks. Eventually, however, they had to confront biological reality. 
The resource, of course, uh, was uh, first uh, utilized uh, off of the Washington coast, and then uh, gradually fishermen went farther and farther when, in order to, uh, to make it easier to, uh, uh, to catch uh, fish, and uh, till eventually uh, they went uh, up as far as the Pribilof Islands uh, in, in the Bering Sea. And, uh, uh, then, uh, when depletion set in, it uh, set in in the, uh, in the southern fringes of the fishery, uh, primarily uh, off of the coast of Washington and then to some extent British Columbia, until uh, a uh, halibut commission uh, was formed in 1924, and then, then uh, began regulations which uh, uh, set uh, seasons and then quotas and uh, a myriad of other regulations designed to uh, to maintain the uh, the resource in uh, in good condition uh, more or less uh, forever and uh, in my opinion uh, it seems that uh, the north pacific is capable of uh, harvesting uh, or yielding uh, uh, 65 million pounds uh, of uh, halibut a year uh, Any time it goes over th that, why well, then the resource begins to suffer. And uh, of course, any time the, the, the catch goes under that, uh, it could be increased. The International uh, Pacific Halibut Commission was formed under the under the pressures from fishermen in the er, in the early 1920s that perceived that the stocks were in poor shape, and uh, they demanded some kind of management res regime be put into place to to see what was, the, what was happening with the stocks. So initially, IPHC, which is the present International Pacific Halibut Commission, uh, started off as a research group to report to the governments to find out what was going on with the stocks. Well, as things happen, uh, more and more research is done, and uh, IPHC was, was kept in place, and it became a, a regulatory body, the first uh, regulatory action that it made was to close the winter fishery during the spawning season. And as the years progressed, uh, it was given more and more authority to create areas and set quotas and so forth, and it just kept growing to, uh, to the size we have it today, which is a, a, has a complete management authority now. Working closely with the Commission were a pair of industry organizations, one representing the vessel owners and another, the fishermen. The Fishing Vessel Owners Association, of course, is, as the name indicates, is an organization of the operators of the halibut uh, vessels, and uh, it uh, started in 1914. Uh, prior to that time, the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union was organized, representing the crews of the vessels, and uh, the two organizations uh, side by side, uh, while they had uh, arguments uh, among themselves at the time, they had uh, many other activities in which uh, they were uh, engaged uh, both on the same side. To sell their catches, the fleet relied on an auction conducted in the morning hours along Seattle's waterfront. Rufus Littlefield founded Seattle Seafoods Company, one of the buyers that attended the auction daily. There's some 11 or 12 buyers involved that participated in the, in the auction, and it was a big blackboard. The, uh, f the skippers would list the hailing and what they felt they had aboard, their, guess their best guesstimate of what they had aboard, the total, total catch, and also by sizes. And then that would be all listed by vote, boat name. Then the buyers would bid on the various, on the various boats. And the bidding was done uh, with tenth of a cent uh, at, at intervals, and when we got up to 20 cents a pound, we got too worried about the price being too high. No, we got along fine, and then everyone realized that the fish had to be divided up between the companies, that the three or four of the largest companies weren't going to get all the fish by any means. It was going to be divided quite equally between all of us, and it was. Littlefield enjoyed his interactions with the halibut fleet. Well, I like the halibut fishermen, the fellows in the fleet. I think they're Tremendous guys, and I had a lot of admiration for them. Uh, going to the far western areas to catch fish and bring it in, in my day, all back in, into Seattle or Prince Rupert, eight-day trips to get to get home with your catch. 
good, honest, fair seafaring people, and I like liked them very much. Today, the fishing continues much as it always has. And despite resource fluctuations over time, North Pacific halibut stocks are in excellent shape. Well, I think halibut stocks are in very, very good shape uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, halibut is a very viable fish. If you give it a break at all, it'll expand. If, if the stocks are low and you uh, ease fishing pressure, uh, the stocks uh, respond very nicely and, and grow very quickly. Uh, that, that really helps, of course. The other thing is that uh, we've always worked very, very closely with industry. Uh, we use industry information uh, to, to set quotas and so forth, plus biological information we collect. It's done very scientifically. There's very little political interference with the st staff's activity, practically none. And when you have an international agency, you seem to get reduced political pressures to overfish. And the, the quotas that have been set for halibut throughout its history have been based on good science. And that's quite different than a lot of other fisheries where politics seem to be the name of the game. If the halibut resource has been healthy over the past decade, the same can't be said for the fleet. Beginning in the 1980s, the abundant halibut resource and overcrowding in other North Pacific fisheries caused an explosion of effort as thousands of new boats found their way to the halibut grounds. Dean Adams, who began his fishing career at age 15 aboard the family schooner Grant, represents the current generation of halibut fishermen. His career has coincided with the transition from the gentleman's fishery of 20 years ago to the frantic derby fisheries of the early 1990s, when fishing seasons that once spanned months were reduced to a matter of hours. The halibut derby turned into a mad race for fish where uh, literally thousands of boats, thousands of people would gear up their vessels and leave town and uh, set their gear when the gun went off. Thousands of miles of gear would be set onto the bottom of the ocean. In some cases, uh, I kind of visualize uh, these long lines looking like a basket weaving of uh, fishing gear on the fishing grounds. Just fishermen setting their gear over one another, creating uh, gear loss problems. And, uh, and 24 hours of just hauling gear as fast as you possibly can trying to keep up with the, the rush of fish if you were to get lucky and, and handle the fish, and then uh, trying to get them down below deck and in a timely fashion. With the advent of the derbies, the halibut fishery changed from a career to a crapshoot. The pace of the fishery jeopardized the safety of the fleet and the status of Alaska halibut as a consistent feature of the seafood marketplace. In 1995, a new regime dawned in the halibut industry, the era of the Individual Fishing Quota, or IFQ, under which qualifying vessels are awarded shares of the annual quota, shares that can be fished at the operator's discretion or sold to the highest bidder. With the quota system in place, the halibut fishery was again an enterprise that engaged the fleet over an extended period of time and supplied premium product to international consumers. And, as always, the industry's renewed good fortune was a tribute to the remarkable fish. I think the, the future of the, the halibut fishery is, is, is very exciting. The halibut fishery is very unique. Uh, it's a small boat fishery, relatively speaking. It's offshore and we cover uh, a very wide range of a very beautiful country called uh, the state of Alaska. There's halibut from one end of that state to the other and uh, I think there always will be.